Hello everyone, my name is Granotsky. I'd like to start by thanking Angela and Jeremy and the participants of this panel for allowing me to participate remotely. The paper I'm presenting relates to the nature of human freedom and unfreedom as they're articulated in the work of Japanese interface engineers. Of utopian literature, Frederick Jameson wrote that utopian texts have for the most part rigorously restricted their textual production to the construction of material mechanisms that would alone enable freedom to come into existence all around them. The mechanism itself, he says, has nothing to do with freedom except to release it. It exists to neutralize what block freedom. What Jameson calls a utopian machine will absorb all that free unfreedom into itself, concentrate it where it can best be worked over and controlled, and allow a whole range of freedoms to flourish outside of itself. In this paper, I want to use Jameson's discussion of utopian machines to examine the freedom and unfreedom that Japanese researchers creating human-machine interfaces condense into their creations. What utopian mechanisms are captured in the technologies that these researchers seek to sketch? Now, to think through this question, I turn my attention to technologies developed by these researchers called human-centered technologies, or HCTs. HCTs are an emerging class of technologies developed with the conviction that for technologies to better serve human purposes, they must embody crucial truths about what humans are. HCTs encompass many technologies, diverse in form, so they can be costly, uh, custom-made androids, and others are cobbled together from off-the-shelf tech and dollar store swim goggles. They can be carefully crafted out of aluminum and silicone or rough with 3D printed edges and unplucked strands of hot glue. Now, each of these has an immediate practical purpose, such as robot control, virtual reality skills training, or telepresence. In the eyes of my informant, such technologies have the potential to recreate their society as a new kind of socio-technical system in which, quote, each individual element contributes to the working of the entirety, creating a great dynamism and a society that is balanced as a whole. Now, beyond the pra diverse practical purposes they had for their technologies, HCT researchers were united in the notion that their technologies were a means to understand what human beings truly are. Now, I encountered one such technology, a robot called the Geminoid F, which was made to closely approximate a Japanese woman in both manner and appearance. She was one of the stars of a play entitled Sayonara, written and directed by Moriza Hirata. In Japan in early 2012, I sat in a darkened room on a university campus watching the Geminoid sitting on stage under a dim spotlight. From where I sat, I couldn't distinguish her by sight from a human woman. A man knelt beside her, and he was some kind of technician. He made a request. He asked her to sit on a beach in the town of Futaba, barely six kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. He wouldn't be able to take her there, he explained. Other robots, her friends, would, since no humans were permitted that far inside the irradiated zone. There, she would face the sea and read poems to give comfort to those who had been washed away in the disasters of March 11, 2011. The man stood and asked her, Will you do this for us? as he bowed to her in a gesture of deep respect. Between them passed an interval of time. Yes, she finally replied. If I can still be of any use, it would make me happy. Now, the robot's promise points to the potential for a machine to reconnect a country fractured by technologies that were once emblems of modern progress. The ruined nuclear power plants and the first robots sent in to unsuccessfully survey them loomed large for the playwright, motivating him to add this scene to his robot theater play for this first performance after 3.11. In a discussion following the performance, he spoke about how the play was meant to show that robots could do more than try to deal with the material effects of the catastrophe. They could simply read poems for the dead in a place where humans could no longer go. The technician hoisted her up onto his shoulder and carried her off stage as she began repeating lines from a poem. The lights went up and applause erupted from the small audience, and the scene evaporated, but I was left contemplating the pause before the robot answered the man's request. What was she truly doing in the interval between request and response? 
Now in the real world, there seemed to be no question. It was the scripted pause of the human actor hidden off stage in front of a microphone and a set of cameras and computer screens that created the robot's action. Now similarly, within the world of the play, the robot may simply have been performing a pre-scripted response to the stimulus given by the human man. In this case, the man's statement wouldn't be a question but a command, and the pause would be the lag of the robot's circuits as it worked to diligently execute its code. But there was another possibility. Perhaps the robot was contemplating the weight of the request. Would reading poems on the beach really comfort the dead? Was she, a machine, adequate to this task? I was preoccupied with the question of whether the robot was fulfilling a command or making an ethical judgment, but as I worked with the researchers who created technologies like her, I came to see that she embodied a higher truth, that between code and ethics there was no essential difference at all. Gregory Bateson argued that when observing the response of a person to another's statement, there is no way to distinguish whether that person has received the statement as a command and mechanically re-encoded it into the form of an action, or has received it as a report of a situation which the person has evaluated to select and execute an appropriate action. At root, they are indistinguishable and are mere aspects of an underlying process that Bateson calls codification evaluation. For Bateson, there is no essential difference between code and ethics. People do act as if there are important differences between them all the time. And these differences have a history. For instance, the Euro-American notion that technologies can only execute coded commands while human beings make ethical judgments is rooted in a history of North Atlantic slavery. As Louis Shudsoke and Ron Eaglash have shown through analyses of the master-slave metaphor for technology, in Euro-American discourse, technologies themselves have long been cultural icons of unfreedom in the form of slavery. Eaglash suggests that the contemporary emergence of the metaphor was associated with the mid-20th century development of cybernetics and autonomous machines. Shudsoke argues that cybernetics in the U.S. was born, quote, out of an awareness of those questions of a black slave's humanity central to late 19th century culture, knowledge, and politics in England and America. As Michel Foucault wrote, the ideal slave is a being, quote, without ethics, able only to act at best as the ethical proxy of a master. If technology in the Euro-American imagination is such a slave, then its unfreedom is in its constitutional inability to make ethical judgments. Machines imagined in this way are utopian machines in the sense that they absorb ethical abjectness into themselves so that humans maintain dominion over the ethical. It's perhaps because autonomous machines continue to be thought through this master-slave relation that so many contemporary technological dreams are based on the possibility of achieving perfect mastery over the world, with perfect slave machines and so many nightmares are about these perfect machines overthrowing humanity. The creators of HCTs also think and work within a cybernetic perspective. They draw from what Catherine Hales called the first wave of cybernetics in which all self-regulating systems, from organisms to humans to autonomous machines and ecosystems, are defined by how they exchange information among their various parts. They imagine both human machine as complex, multiply interconnected systems that differ in the structures of their circuitry. As part of a global engineering community, these researchers use the master-slave metaphor, but alongside it, they draw on another model for thinking about human-machine relations, the master and apprentice. For many interfaces, whether they are technologies that mediated interactions between human users or between humans and machines, the members of the pairs were often referred to as experienced and inexperienced, or teacher and student, rather than or in addition to master and slave. The relation between the master and the apprentice does not map ethical subjectivity onto the master and non-ethicality onto its subordinate. James Fabian points out that, quote, an ethical master must devote him or herself to the enhancement and refinement of the reflexive freedom of students. The master must, Fabian continues, devote himself to the production of other masters. His politics his politics cannot ultimately be a politics of domination. It must instead rest in the maintenance and promotion of power relations. The master of the slave enjoys complete freedom in their ethical judgments because the slave is completely unfree. 
In contrast, the master of the apprentice is only relatively free in comparison to the apprentice. Both are subject to power relations that emanate from elsewhere. Returning to Jameson, it would be these power relations that draw the lines around the utopian machine and its concentration of unfreedom. What is unfreedom in human-centered technology and where does it lie? So in addition to being apprentices, HCTs, including the geminoid, are also referred to as bunxing, or a partial body, other self. Their machines are partial copies of the master. For instance, a male version of the geminoid is used by its creator to attend research meetings at another institution, which to his dismay, and despite his lobbying of the administration, are not counted as physical time on site to fulfill his contract. Another researcher writes about the ideal HCT as an artificially intelligent assistant that has experienced the same things as you from the moment you were born. It would know you better than any other person and be able to suggest useful courses of action. Such a partner would be like a bunxing, taking over common repetitive tasks so that the human host would be freer to direct his or her attention to matters that demanded closer human attention. For HCT researchers, the human is neither an embodiment of freedom nor the machine the pure, unfree slave. Neither is freedom a matter of ethical autonomy and unfreedom its total mechanistic lack. Instead, the human is an assemblage of the free and unfree, and its unfreedom consists of the routine and the repetitive. Its unfreedom is in being bound to perform what Julia El Yashar called the fatic labor that maintains the socio-technical infrastructures of life in contemporary Japan. Its mechanisms of unfreedom can be replicated and offloaded to machines. But this mechanism is not an amoral one. This is why many HCTs are designed to bypass or lighten the burdens of everyday routines that a person faces in having to maintain social awareness. And here, I mean technologies that serve the role of social icebreakers, bypassing the perennial issue of figuring out if you have anything to talk about with a new acquaintance. Or increasingly prevalent robots like Pepper, who are positioned inside shops, just so entering customers have someone to offer a greeting and eye contact. And it is also why the Geminoid with whom I began this paper can bear the heavy responsibility of comforting the dead by endlessly repeating poems on, a, on an abandoned beach. These technologies and their human masters are both subject to a broader configuration of power relations. In the case of the robot on the beach, it is a configuration which remakes the connections of Japan which were socially and materially fractured by disaster. Foucault once wrote about power as though it were a chain of cybernetic messages calling power quote, something that circulates, as never localized here or there, and the individual subject to it as relays of power. The power relations to which the masters and apprentices of HCT are subject splits the human body into an unfree system, tasked with the mechanical and repetitive but still ethically significant routines of everyday life, and another that finds freedom in its encounters with the extraordinary in the service of sustaining a broader socio-technical system, this is a mechanism of unfreedom that human-centered technologies can take up, becoming partial bodies of human beings and yet still able to keep the circuits of power going. Now, as I record this in New Zealand, two weeks before the AAAs, I'm imagining the out-of-placeness of this recording among the papers that will be given by people present in the flesh. But my being able to do this raises questions that are similar to the ones that my informants think about. Is this digital recording human enough to do this paper for me? So regardless of the quality of my paper, I'd like you to clap or not based on whether you felt like I was present enough for this paper. The applause will be an index of whether this recording and all of the infrastructures needed to bring it here were human enough to do this job in my place. Thank you.